Hi, it's Erica Kohlberg. And before we dive into today's podcast episode, I have an exciting announcement that can help you save an extra $1,000 without having to penny pinch or change your lifestyle. On Monday, I'm running my free five-day savings challenge where you'll discover simple and creative ways that you can save extra money every month. And whatever you want to do with that extra money is up to you. I'll just show you how to save it. The challenge is totally free to join. All you need to do is go to erica.com slash go. Erica is with a K and you can secure your spot. By the way, these strategies that you're going to discover can help you easily save money, whether you're a budgeting novice or a finance expert, and they're going to get better and better throughout the week. But I have to tell you, I'm so excited about this and don't want you to miss out. In November of last year, we ran a savings challenge and had over 200,000 people sign up. And on average, people saved $1,005 that month through what they learned in the challenge. That means our challengers collectively saved over $200 million. So trust me when I say you don't want to miss out on this one. And the deadline to sign up to be part of this free challenge is Sunday, 11.59 p.m. Eastern time. So make sure you secure your spot and get free access today. Again, that's erica.com slash go, E-R-I-K-A dot com slash go. See you inside. I'm Erica Kohlberg, and you're listening to the Erica Taught Me podcast. So what is the most difficult personality type to deal with in the workplace? None of them are fun, right? Anyone who pushes your buttons is going gonna, is gonna to be challenging. But I would say the one I hear the most about is the passive aggressive peer and and. This in my book, actually, this was the first chapter I wrote because it was the question I keep getting asked over and over of like, how do I deal with passive aggressive behavior? And I say it's the most difficult, not because it's necessarily like the most upsetting or um, the most hurtful. It's just it can feel like you're shadow boxing, right? Like you say one thing or ask them a question, they give you an answer, which, you know, isn't quite true. So then you dig a little bit deeper, but you can never quite land and with them. Mm -hmm. And so it can be the most maddening of, I know they have thoughts and feelings that they're not telling me, and there's no way for me to get them to be straightforward. So how would you describe the passive aggressive type? I love the or the history behind a lot of this behavior. So the origin of the term passive aggressive actually comes from the U.S. military. In the First World War, it was used to describe soldiers who were non-compliant with their officers' orders. Right, so they were considered not, um, passive aggressive. It then has this storied history of it was a formal diagnosis. It was part of the DSM four. Then it wasn't, and then and now it's sort of more of a layman's term and. The way I think about it is that it's expressing thoughts or feelings in an indirect way. So think about that body language where I say everything's fine and I sit back and cross my arms, right? You know not everything's fine mm -hmm. or you can tell the tone of my voice. Or in a workplace context, you know, someone says, yeah, I'll definitely follow up on that. And then they never do, right? So they're actually telling you, I don't agree with this or I'm not okay through non-direct ways. And so you're left to sort of figure out what do they actually mean? Wait, so the part where you're saying, I'll follow up on that and then they never actually do, how is that passive aggressive? I'm not sure I see that connection. So it's it's passive in that they're saying, yes, I'll do it, but they actually have no intention of doing it, right? I don't know if that that's sort of what, what I'm talking about. Oh. I mean, there's of course people who are like, you know, don't follow through, right? Or who don't, um, you know, do what they say. And that's different. Like they get distracted or they're but the person who says, oh, yeah, I'll totally do that when they have no intention of doing it. That's the passive aggressive part. And what causes someone to do that? What creates passive aggressive people? If I was a psychiatrist, I could probably give, <laughs> give you lots of reasons. The, the, but there's a lot of things. One, fear of conflict. So instead of telling you, I actually don't think this is the smart thing to do. I think we should do something else. I just don't do it. Right. So instead of having the conflict, the actual discussion, um, I'm just avoiding it completely. So that's one. Fear of rejection is a is an, another big one. So if I actually tell you I don't like what you're doing or um, I don't see it the same way, I then worry you're going to reject me. It's going to hurt our our relationship. And honestly, sometimes it's a learned behavior. Mm. Right? And I think about, I won't name names because it wouldn't be fair, but I think about people in my life who have parents who are very passive aggressive. Right? They then also see that as a normal way to interact with other people. 
And so, and that's a lot of the behaviors, a lot of the problematic behaviors we see at work is oftentimes people have been taught that this is an okay way to interact. This is an okay way to be. And how do you deal with passive aggressive people? And does it depend, does the style that you should deal with them differ depending on whether they are your colleague, your employee, or your employer? Yeah. So most of the advice around dealing with anyone, let's focus on passive aggressive, you know, is sort of generic, meaning it doesn't matter whether it's your peer, your supervisor, or someone you manage. However, you have to keep in mind the power dynamic, right? And so when you're dealing with your boss who's being passive aggressive, you might not be as direct. You might not confront them. Whereas with a peer, you might do that. So let me give an example. So one of the things that passive aggressive folks often do is they, you know, say something and they sort of wrap it in a snarky wrapping, right? Like they'll say, yeah, sure, I'll do that. But they'll say it in a really snarky way. Mm. And you get really hung up on why are they speaking to me that way? That's not an appropriate way to talk to a colleague. They shouldn't do that. Rather than getting hung up on the snarkiness, try to focus on the underlying message, right? What are they actually trying to convey? And then I use a tip that um, Heidi Grant, who's an organizational psychologist, shared with me, a social psychologist actually shared with me, which is called hypothesis testing. So if you say, no, I'm fine, but you suspect, "Mm, I don't think they're fine, your hypothesis is they're actually upset about something. And then you might say, I hear you saying you're fine. I just want to test something out. Is it possible you're upset about something I said before? Does that ring true? Is there is there something I could do differently? And you start to sort of fish a little bit of like, what's your true thought and feeling rather than what you've told me? Now, an extreme passive aggressive person will just be like, nope, I'm fine. Right. They'll just, but you put them on notice that you're paying attention to the underlying message, not just the way they're delivering it and not just what they're saying on the surface. So if we take that example, right, you can use that with a boss. You can use that with someone you manage. um, You can use that certainly with a peer, a friend, a neighbor, right? There's so many, that's sort of a universal. There might be something with passive aggressive folks. Now, you never, one of the things you definitely don't want to do is be like, you're being passive aggressive, (laughs) right? Because no one goes home from work every day, any day and says, what I was today, I was really passive aggressive, right? And they, I'm glad someone called me out on that. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> and it was so helpful, right? Remember, this is probably based on fear and insecurity. Telling them they're passive aggressive is just going to throw them further into that hole. So instead, you you might be, you know, have a what I call a meta conversation with them at some point and say, a lot of times you say you're going to do something in a meeting and then you don't follow up afterwards. I get the sense you don't actually agree with what we're talking about in the meeting. Could that be what's leading to the lack of follow-up, right? So again, that's sort of that hypothesis testing, but it's a little more direct. You're pointing out a pattern of behavior. That's going to be harder to do with a boss because you're going to be worried. Will, will they retaliate? Will they be upset with me? Will this affect my performance rating? Whether I get this promotion, so you might not use a little a more direct tactic with a boss. You might use some of the more indirect tactics. So I used to have someone on my team who would drop a lot of tasks and she would say, I'll handle that. I'll get to it. And then they would just drop. Mm. And I always thought she was forgetful. How do I know if it's forgetfulness or passive aggressive? Mm, that's a good question because it could be forgetfulness. It could be overwhelmed, right? It could be And it could be that she doesn't actually believe the tasks are worth doing, right? That passive aggressive. Again, you have to, you won't ever know. And this is one of the things I think when you're dealing with challenging folks at work is that you want to not presume, right? Not presume you know why. That when I talk about sort of what's underlying or motivating the behavior, it's meant for you as a diagnostic, right? It's not meant for you to be like, I figured out everything that's the way your parents raised you that's wrong with that. <laughs> um, we're just going to solve this. Right? Like, And you're not going to say, I figured this out. You're not forgetful. You're being passive aggressive. Again, it's not helpful. But if you have some hunches about what's going on, you can do some of that hypothesis testing, or you could even have a direct conversation and say, especially as her manager, you know, I noticed the past four times I've asked you to do something, the task has fallen off your list, hasn't gotten done. Every time I ask you about it, you say you're going to do it. I totally believe you, but I'm starting to wonder if there's something else going on. Could it be 
that you don't actually think these tasks are important? Or could it be that you aren't organized? Like what's going on? Right. And again, you may not get a straight answer, mm -hmm. but you, what you want to think about is what's your goal, right? You're not, your goal isn't to like do therapy with them and resolve all of their unresolved issues. Your goal is to get them to do the tasks. So what would it take to get them to do the task? That's what you want to focus on. Mm, that makes sense. I was interviewing someone a few weeks ago. And one of the questions I always ask in interviews is, what do you not like about your current boss that is causing you to think you may want to transition to another uh, role? And she answered that her boss was quite passive aggressive. Mm -hmm. And whenever she would do something wrong, he would ignore her for two, three days. Oh, How do you deal with that level of passive aggressiveness when it comes to your boss, someone who you're supposed to work very closely with? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and ideally, you want to have a positive. I mean, we know the the many upsides of having a positive relationship with your boss, with all, all of the people you work with. There's actually a story, I think it's in the passive aggressive chapter of I interviewed this person who was, it was her business partner where they would have a challenging conversation and her business partner wouldn't speak to her for like three months. And she was sort of telling me this, this was a pattern that kept repeating itself. And I was like, you went to the same office every day, ran this business together and you didn't speak. And she said, yes, like we, we exchanged occasionally cold texts, but that's it. Yeah. I know. Truthfully for her, she had to leave. They ended up getting a mediator to help them sort of figure out how mm -hmm. to separate the business. I'm not saying the only solution is to quit. I would ask that person, like, what toll is this taking on you? Because as much as I believe most relationships are, can uh, be neutralized, if not even made a little bit more positive, I don't think you should suffer. And mm. To me, having a boss who didn't speak to me for two or three days would take a real toll. Yeah. And I think I, I would find that really hard to deal with. You know, I, I think there are probably small things that, that that person could do of maybe even having a conversation with her boss of saying, when you're unhappy with me, I can tell you're really unhappy. Is there anything I could do differently? And you might get a straight answer. You might not. But something that sort of acknowledges this sort of pattern of, of real icing out. And again, sometimes if you just tell people you notice what's happening, sometimes they're like, ooh, right, I probably shouldn't be doing that. Or that's not the most professional. When do you decide then? I mean, where is that line where you decide, okay, my boss is exhibiting these passive aggressive qualities, and I don't think they're going to fix it. And I don't think my feelings around it are going to change. So it's time to leave. Where is that line? I wish there was a clear line. I get asked that question so many times. And, you know, the should I quit question is a big one. What I do believe is that one of the worst feelings is feeling stuck as if you don't have an agency, right? I'm stuck in this job. I'm stuck with this boss who's behaving passive aggressively. They're, I've tried I've tried all these tactics to get them to be more productive, more straightforward, and it's not working. That feeling of being stuck is terrible. So you want to restore some sense of agency by making a plan. And what I mean by that is like get very specific about what are the two or three behaviors your boss exhibits that are really problematic for you. What are two or three tactics you can try to work on that? And, and they might, again, be talking to them directly. There might be some sort of indirect nudges. It might even be escalating the issue, right, to HR if you have a trustworthy um, HR person. And then tell yourself, okay, I'm giving it three months. I'm giving it four months. If it, things don't change, then I'm going to make then I'm going to make a shift. In the meantime, during that three or four months, brush up your resume, have a few coffees with people, right? Like start giving yourself an exit plan if you need it. Mm -hmm. Because one one of the things I notice for myself and for others is that when you have other options, sometimes your current option starts to look a little more appealing. I interviewed for my book, I interviewed Bob Sutton, who's a professor at Stanford and for about the chapter about quitting. And he, he tells this great story, which I love, which he says, I'm a mem he says, he's a member of the grasses Browner club. <laughs> he had been at Stanford for years. He was like sort of sick of the politics and just was like, not felt like he wasn't really, you know, sort of getting what he wanted. And so he went to Cal and he was like, this is going to be better. And he got a raise. He was so excited. And then he got there and he was like, this is worse. Like the dynamics <laughs> are even worse. And so he went back to Stanford at a pay cut 
And so he was like, it was the best thing I ever did. And he said, that's, you know, and it's true. I think quitting can be an overrated option in that we think some other mysterious, uncertain place is going to be much better and than what we currently have, which is often not true. But it's also often an underrated option. I see people sit in situations for so long where they're not sleeping, they're questioning themselves, their confidence has just plummeted. And I'm like, why would, why haven't you left, right? Mm-hmm. Why haven't you found a different situation? Something's got to be better than this. So in an ideal world, you would be able to spot a passive aggressive boss mm-hmm. during the interview phase before you commit to working there. Is that possible? Oh, wouldn't that be amazing? Like, <laughs> I, I always think about this because people often say, like, I, I, I thought they were wonderful. Like in the interview process, I was so excited to work with them. They told me they cared about my growth and development. They said all the right things. And I wish there was like, you know, the stud finders on a wall where you try to find the stud and it like beeps and turns red when you find. I wish there was like, you could find a bad boss. Like, (laughs) you know, you just like wave this thing over them and it beeps if if they're a bad boss. You know, there are some red flags. Like I would, I would certainly ask some questions like, How do you handle conflict when you and someone who works for you don't see eye to eye? How does it get resolved? The person who was in this last position, where where did they go? Right. And you have to pay such attention because they will have the right answer. Right. And then you have to sort of pay attention to their body language. How are they reacting? You know, we have so much research material available to us now these days, like find someone at LinkedIn who worked for that person Mm -hmm. once. Can you send them a private message? I just think we 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 take people at their word, which unfortunately, most of us are pretty good liars. And so I think we just have to, and and not to say that most people are trying to deceive you. Again, that boss doesn't think they're passive aggressive. Sure. They think they might be petty sometimes, or they might be a little hotheaded or, oh, I'm not as direct as I should be. But they're not, even if you could ask them directly, are you passive aggressive? They might even not know. And so You have to really pay attention to the cues, do a little background research and find out what you can. And then remember, I know the cost of switching jobs is uh, is high, but don't feel like you're stuck. Don't feel like you have to stay in that position. I have people who like they're two months in and they're like, oh, my gosh, like this boss is worse than I even imagined. It's like, get out now, like just cut your losses. It's not worth it. Because most of the time when people are passive aggressive, it's not like they're going to improve. If anything, you can only change yourself. So maybe you improve with the way you cope with that. Yes. But they're probably not going to change. So believing that they are, if they're showing these signs two months in, is probably not a good move. They're likely not going to change because think about something you've wanted to change about yourself. Let's say you decided you wanted to be more direct in how you communicate, although you seem quite direct, but you wanted to be more direct in how you communicate. You didn't just decide one day you were going to do that and then do it, right? You likely decided you wanted to do it, had to figure out why you weren't doing it, had to make an effort, and you probably tried and failed and tried and failed, and maybe you made a little bit of progress but chances are you didn't become a completely different person from someone who was very indirect to all of a sudden someone who's very direct, right? Mm-hmm. We, most of us don't make change that quickly, right? Behavior change is hard. So even if your boss is A, aware that they're being passive aggressive, B, committed to changing, those are two really high hurdles already. <laughs> like the fact that they could is a whole other story. And so, yes, you have to accept the people you work with are not going to change. I wish you could hand someone a prescription for years of therapy and say, go ahead, go do this, and then we'll interact, right? (laughs) But even with that years of therapy, they might not change. So you do exactly, as you said, have to really figure out how you change you, how you react to them, Mm -hmm. how you absorb or don't absorb their behavior, what you say and do in reaction to the passive aggressive behavior or whatever kind of behavior it is. I love being an entrepreneur, and I think everyone should have at least one side hustle. A good website is a no-brainer when it comes to running a business, but what's equally important is your domain name. It's basically your digital business address, and it's where today's sponsor has got you covered. Dot Online Domains has over 3.4 million active domains globally and is home to thousands of businesses across travel, technology, retail, creative services, and more. 
It's about more than just appearances, though. Did you know the word online is searched 130 million times a month? It's also understood in more than 24 languages, giving you huge SEO potential and the opportunity to take your business global from just your domain name. Put simply, Dot .online domains offers game-changing domains at a price point that gives you maximum value for your money. You can grab your Dot .online domain from GoDaddy, Namecheap, or Wix, they're everywhere. However, just for a limited time, I have an exclusive offer just for my viewers. Go to get.online slash Erica right now and using the coupon code Erica, you can now get your dot .online domain just for 99 cents for the first year. That's get.online slash Erica. Erica is always with a K. You can also click the link in the description. So in your book, you talk about eight personality types and everyone fits into typically one of these personality types so that we have the passive aggressive colleague or boss. What is the next most difficult one to deal with? So I will say the the one that I find most challenging is the tormentor. And I called that chapter the tormentor because this is someone you expect to be a mentor. They're higher up in the organization. Maybe they're your direct boss. Maybe they're a few levels above. And you think they might actually be invested in your career for some reason. Maybe you are both women. Maybe they you went to the same college. Maybe they're, you know, you just had some sort of connection. But rather than supporting your career, they seem to be undermining it, right? They question whether you're committed enough. They don't understand why you're not making more sacrifices for the work. They may assign you needless tasks just to keep you busy or overwork you. And it's really painful. And in fact, of all the chapters, the eight chapters, I interviewed lots of people for each chapter. That was the chapter where the most people quit, actually, um, rather than being able to find a solution. There were some people who were able to find a solution. But um, I think that that sort of questioning of your commitment, of your competence can be really, really wearing. I know when I was at the law firm, I was working as a corporate lawyer right out of law school. And in the entire law firm, there were only two female partners. Mm. And you would hope that these women would want to bring other women up because there weren't enough women in my level and the junior level and the middle level and the senior level. But at least one of them was very much a tormentor where yeah. she was kind of the, the mentality that I worked so hard to get where I am and no one helped me. Therefore, you better prove yourself if you want to move up the ladder. Yeah. I, there's someone I interviewed for the book. I, I think I call her Colleen in the book, but she had a boss similar to what you're describing. And she, she told me, she said, I think she thinks she's doing me a favor. She's actually thinks she's toughening me up so I can, they worked in the advertising industry so that I can actually succeed here as a woman. It's such a misguided <laughs> way of thinking and, and behaving. And we often use the term, and I talk about this in that chapter, the queen bee, which I'm sure you've heard of. Right? And, and that's exactly this woman who's made it, um, is successful, has made lots of sacrifices likely because of the gender bias she had to navigate to get where she is. And now the perception is that she is you know, just mistreating women who come up behind her particularly as in your experience with the law firm, because it just doesn't seem fair. Why would I have to struggle? And now you come up, Gen Z millennial, with like, you know, on our coattails, you have such an easy time. You have no understanding of what it takes. I have to be honest. I have empathy for that perspective. If, some, if I really worked hard to get somewhere and I saw people having a much easier time, I'd be a little resentful. Mm -hmm. Would I torture them? Probably not. <laughs> um, but but I think that it, it's an understandable reaction. Tell me what personality type this is. So okay. I had this also at the law firm. There was this one guy, we'll call him Chad, who would take credit for everything. Like I would be the one working so hard late into the night, but he was very charming and charismatic and got along so well with the bosses that they would go have their drinks after work. And so he gave this impression that he was very hardworking, but really it was me that was doing all of the work and he would take credit for it. Who is that? Oh boy. <laughs> Chapter nine, that's the political operator. Okay. So it's someone who plays politics, right? Office politics, which we all do. We all should be doing at least to some degree, but does it in a way that 
furthers their career at the detriment of everyone else's, right? So it's like the classic, like, I blow your candle out so mine looks brighter. And they're very good at appearing competent, productive, hardworking, when oftentimes they're not any of those things. It's just the veneer that they give off. And one of their main tactics is credit stealing. And, and it's so infuriating <laughs> to, to, be on, to be on the receiving end of that because you're sitting there in the meeting going, wait, I did? What? Wait, what is he saying? Is he saying I, I, I? And you're like, no, we, and actually not even you, me did all this work. Yeah. So frustrating. How do you deal with them? So one, I think if you know, if you know this person and you know, this is what they do, if when you start to work on a project, you can say right away, Hey, let's agree, a, you know, ahead of time, how we're going to share credit. When we present this to the senior leadership team, let's start with a slide that says everyone's name who worked on the project. Um, don't end with the slide, by the way, because they'll skip it, right? Start with the slide, right? Or let's agree now who's going to present this when it comes up. That's one thing. You can try to sort of preempt the behavior. Another thing you can do is in the moment, let's say they are, have, you're in a meeting and they're acting like, well, I did this, I did this. You can ask a, a question that makes it clear that you did the work too. So you can say, hey, Chad, don't forget to let people know about this. Actually, why don't I let people know? Because I was more involved with that, right? And it doesn't have to be pointed. You can be, say that in a neutral tone, but it just demonstrates to everyone in the room, this wasn't just Chad. Political operators, one of the things I appreciate about them is they often tend to be relatively straightforward when you have a conversation with them. So sometimes I've even done this with people where I've said, um, Hey, Chad, you kept saying I in that meeting, but you know, I did the majority of the work. You just sort of came in at the end. What's up with that? And then again, Chad might be like, what are you talking about? I did all the work, you know, fine. But now you've put Chad on notice that you were paying attention to Mm. his political operating ways and you're not going to let him get away with it. That's so interesting. I remember my Chad would even like, if there was a mistake, then he would pin it on me. Of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Even though that part wasn't right, on me. Right. Wait, oh, this question, I'm going to let Erica answer this one because she did that. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is bringing back trauma no, from I'm the law <laughs> I'm sorry. You know, again, you can say, oh, yeah, there were a few mistakes. I'm really familiar with them given how much time I put into this. Um, let me acknowledge that and talk about everything that went right. Mm. Right. Like, you don't, what you don't want to do is to get into this tug of war because though they... It, like your Chad, the Chads of the world. <laughs> I love Chad has become the political operator name. But the Chads of the world, exactly like you said, have good relationships with mm-hmm. the higher ups. They've worked really hard to do that. So if it becomes a tit for tat or a, a you, you said, they said, they're going to win um, because they already have the ear or the the sort of respect of, of the higher ups. You don't want to you don't want to put them down. That's yeah. going to put you in a bad position. But you can put yourself in the story, right? Asking the question, making the comment, something that demonstrates you did this. And then you have a conversation later with Chad of like, hey, what's up with this? Like, mm. I thought I thought we both worked on this or I did most of the work and I feel like you're taking credit. What's going on? If I look back at my time at the law firm, the political operator was probably the personality type I was the most envious of because I saw how far it got them. So how could I have learned to become a better political operator? I'm so glad you asked this. This is one of the most important questions about the political operator because they are playing off this politics well and they are getting ahead. They're getting the promotions. They're getting the raises. They're getting the respect. So one of the things I tell people is rather than see them through the lens of, oh my God, they're gross. I won't do any of that. Pay attention to what they do well. How did they build those relationships with the higher ups? What do they say in the meeting? Where do they sit? right? Who do they have coffee with? Who do I see them going out to lunch with? Pay attention and then commit. I can play that game too while also bringing others up, right? Mm. So play the positive parts, the relationship building, the credibility building, the connections. Build that, but don't do any of the credit stealing, lying, right? Resolve to be like, I'm going to play this in a good way. You can play office politics in a way that hurts others, and you can play office politics in a way that helps others. So let's say one of the things that Chad does well is takes, you know, someone senior up out to coffee. Can you do that? And when you're there with having that coffee, can you also mention your colleague down the hall who also does a great job? 
right? Mm. Can you do it in a way that helps build the reputation of others in addition to yourself? Women especially, there's a lot of gender bias about who actually gets to play office politics because it requires you be confident, assertive, all of these things that we typically don't allow women to do without some sort of penalty. And for myself and most women I know, it's taken a long time, often decade plus of being in the workforce to realize office politics aren't dirty. They aren't negative. We all play them. It's it's if you stop calling it office politics and you call it relationship building mm-hmm. or networking, right? Then it's that has a completely different feel. And no one would say those are bad things to do. What about the personality type, the know it all? Oh boy. All right. Now we're getting to the good stuff. And I say the good stuff because I identify as the know it all. And it's uh it's it I wrote that chapter with just like cringing the entire time because I was just like, oh, this is me. I'm giving advice to my husband. I'm giving advice to my coworkers. Like I'm going to have to give them this chapter. You know, the know-it-all is someone who just brokers in confidence. They know that if they say something with 150% certainty, even if they only have like 10% certainty, that people will listen. And It is something I have noticed, certainly in my career, the more confidently I say something, the less likely people are to question it. (laughs) And it's terrible because it's like you and you can see um, how it can just lead to all this bad behavior. Now, I will say humans tend to be overconfident in general. One of my favorite statistics on this is that if you ask people if they're a better than average driver, 75% of people will say yes, which is a statistical impossibility, right? But we overestimate our our performance on so many things all the time. So it's normal to be be overconfident. However, um, the other thing is that we often rely on people to tell us how good they are at something when we don't have a, a clean way of assessing how good they are. So like leadership, or managing, or so many, so many of the jobs that happen these days are creative. Like, there's no way to actually man, like, measure whether they're doing well at mm-hmm. it. So we rely on them to tell us. And the more confident they sound, the more we believe they're good at it. There's a Harvard Business Review article. It's one of the most popular articles uh, they've ever published, which is called "Why Do So Many Incompetent Men Become Leaders?" <laughs> and it. Tomas Tremor of her music who wrote the article talks about it's because of this confidence, right? This confidence gap, which is that we don't test people's competence in something. We just rely on them to tell us how good they are. So that's what the know-it-all takes complete advantage of that situation. This is why, you know, there's that famous stat of that men, if they look at a job description and believe they meet 60% of the qualifications, they'll apply. They're like, oh, yeah, sure. Whereas women need feel like they need to meet 100%. If they just don't even qualify for on one thing, they think it's not worth it. And this is that, again, that sort of confidence gap that, that we see. And it leads to this know-it-all behavior where well, I don't have to. I don't have to have full knowledge of this. I can just say what I want, or get that job, or you know, be considered an expert in this field. So, have you found that most people are on a spectrum of, let's say, ninety percent passive aggressive, ten percent know it all, or even more mild, like fifty fifty? Or yeah, I mean, it sort of depends. It's not an exact science. It's not like a mutually exclusive list. In fact, there's probably other archetypes that could have been included in the book. These were just the ones in my research that sort of kept coming up over and over. So, you know, someone actually recently proposed the, another archetype, a ninth archetype, the neglector, right? So the boss who's completely hands-off mm-hmm. and actually doesn't, doesn't even when you want them to be involved, doesn't get involved. So the opposite of, of a micromanager. So to answer your question, I do think we're it, it were a mix of many of them typically, like two or three. And then we lean into them in different situations. So you might, your insecurity might flare up if the organization is going through a big transition and you're not sure where your team and you are going to end up at the end of it, right? So you might lean into that insecure manager or you might be sort of a know-it-all and a political operator 
But when you're in a new situation, you lean into the know-it-all behavior because you're trying to prove yourself, right? You're trying to help people sort of gain confidence in you. So we've gone through the eight personality types that you describe in your book. Is there one that is the best of them all? Like, I want a boss who is this personality type, or I want colleagues who is this personality type. None of them are great (laughs) because because it's a book about dealing with difficult people. So none of them are great. That said, I think some of them are easier to deal with. And I think actually the insecure manager, there's there's really good research that shows that forming an alliance with them, showing them that you're on your their side, even paying them compliments, which I don't love, but is has been shown to work. Um, so there are some of them that where the tactics are generally more successful. Mm. So insecure manager is one of those. Political operator too. It, they're not going to stop necessarily doing the things that are problematic, but you can um, convince them not to do it at your detriment. Like they might still you know, try to further their career and all that, but they might, you can usually convince them to stop lying to you or t- stealing credit. Got it. And when do you decide after you've tried these tactics that maybe nothing's going to change? It's not going to work. I wish I could tell you you were going to follow the like eight tactics in each chapter and you were going to have a perfect relationship. You're going to ride off into the sunset (laughs) with your your colleague. But the reality is that we're humans are messy. We're not perfect. And behavior change is hard. So chances are the dynamics not going to shift overnight and it's not going to shift dramatically. But if you, what I like to do is think of it as an experiment, right? I'm dealing with this passive aggressive colleague or I'm dealing with Chad, the political operator. What tactics can I try? Let me choose one or two, see how they work. Did they work in this scenario? Did they work when I was in a group meeting, but not a one-on-one with him? And then just learn from that, right? And that's how you sort of build that resilience too, is next time a Chad walks into your office or you move to a new organization and there's someone else who's passive aggressive, you're like, I've done this before. Let me experiment again and see what works. So I think you really have to experiment and then set a time limit. The same way that we talked about quitting before, set a time limit of like, I'm going to try these eight tactics over the next six months. If nothing changes, I'm going to make a shift, get transferred to another department, figure out how not to be staffed on the same project as them, maybe quit your job. So how can I become better than at managing different personality types? Mm. The most important thing is to is to try to be curious, right? What motivates this person? What helps them, right? What and and I think sometimes we think about we have a management style, like here's how I lead. And if you get too stuck in that, you're only going to be good at leading certain people because it's only going to work for a good number of, you know, a handful of people. So you have to instead be curious, right? What's what is what works with this person? What doesn't? How can I make this better? How can I ask the right questions? How can I tap into what motivates them? And then ask them, right, for feedback. But I think one of the best things we can do is to reflect like, okay, this went well with this person. What made it go well? What did I do differently in this situation? What did they do? Okay, this situation went terribly wrong. What did I do? What was my and I think oftentimes we're moving so quickly in organizations. We don't take that time for reflection, especially as leaders. Mm. And I think that's that's what's going to really build your ability to navigate different people. The other thing, and I and this is really important, is to remember that your perspective is just one perspective. So you have a way. And certainly as the the leader of this company, you get to say, I want things to be done this way or that way. But that doesn't mean you're, there's not other perspectives or other successful ways of doing things. And I think you just have to be open-minded that you have to be flexible of, okay, I thought we should do A, B, and C, but this person started with C and is now moving to D and that looks really wrong. But let me just give them the benefit of the doubt and see where that goes. So you just have to be open. What about when you are just in a bad work situation, there's a lot of conflict there. How do you deal with that? Do you have specific tools that you recommend people use to deal with this workplace conflict? Yeah. You know, uh, my first book was is called The HBR Guide to Dealing with Conflict. And that's a, it's a very straightforward, practical, sort of almost guide. Yeah, it is a guide, but like a sort of workbook for how do I deal with, with, with conflict? And I'll share one tool in that. Um, it, you know, most 
when we think about conflict, it's really about difficult conversations, right? Everything is about the interaction. How does it get played out? So how in a difficult interaction or a difficult conversation, how can I approach it in a way that's going to set it up for success? And I have a, a four-step tool I use or I share in that book. Uh, the first step is to think about the other person because chances are you're really focused on you and what you stand to gain or lose, what you need to say, what questions you need to ask. And you just need to spend some time thinking about what does this other person care about? What's motivating them? What are they up against? What are the hurdles they're facing to, to you know, meet this goal that we're trying trying to meet? And that'll get you out of that sort of naturally narcissistic rumination that most of us do before a difficult conversation. You don't even have to be right about what you're thinking about them or what you're supposing they might do differently um, or what they care about. But as long as you do that exercise of just thinking about them, I think mm. it can really, really help. The second step is to know what you're disagreeing about. So sometimes conflict just feels like, oh, this is bad. We're having a personality clash. I don't know what's going on. Our relationship is at stake. Chances are the conflict started as something else, right? And maybe what we call in the academic literature, a task conflict, a disagreement over the goal or the objective. What are we trying to do? Or maybe it's a process conflict. We, dis we agree on the goal, but we disagree about how we're going to get there. Or it might be a status conflict, a disagreement over who's in charge, who gets to make the call. If you can thread out the various types of conflict that you're having, when you actually sit down to have the conversation, you can say, Here's what I think we're disagreeing over the goal. Do you see it that way too? Or I disagree, think we're disagreeing over the process. And you might even say, this isn't about our relationship. I know we work well together. This is what this is about. It might be about your relationship, but maybe not. So that's so first think about the other person, then figure out what type, and then determine what do you actually want out of the situation, right? Mm -hmm. What's your goal? Is it to uh, make sure they understand what that what they did? Um, it cannot be repeated. Is it to preserve your relationship because you're going to have to work with this person over and over? Is it that you want this project to just get done on time, right? What is your actual goal? And then keep that in mind as you move to the fourth step, which is decide what to do. So based on what you know about the other person, what type of conflict you're having and what your goal is, you can then decide, okay, are we going to sit down and hash this out? Like, will that actually be productive? Would that help? Am I going to just let this slide? Because if I bring it up, it could de derail the project and we won't get it done on time. And that's my goal. You know, thinking through what are the pros and cons of different sub approaches and what's going to be most likely to get you to that to that goal. So I know there's probably no clear cut answer on this, but I'm also curious as a manager, when I'm looking at my team and I'm noticing okay, this person is passive aggressive. How and when can I make that decision that maybe they're not a fit for that team and maybe that behavior is impacting not just me, but everyone on the team? The hardest thing for managers to do is to decide to let someone go. It's just such an agonizing decision on many levels. Therefore, I think many managers avoid it. I never have heard someone say, oh, I fired that person too soon. I should have given them five more chances, right? It's more like, oh my God, I let that drag on when it finally ended. It was it was great. I There's no like clear answer of like, they did this thing five times and therefore they need to be fired. I would really pay attention to how their behavior is impacting the dynamic of the team because often the real risk is not that the work doesn't get done. It's that it impedes other people from also doing their work and it brings the team down. So I would pay attention to that. Is the behavior just task oriented or is it more affecting the culture of, of the team? I would also sort of do some of the mental exercise of like, if I didn't have to deal with this person tomorrow, would I just feel incredibly relieved with the rest of the team feel incredibly relieved? Um, that's often a sign that something's going on. And then I would make a, keep a real clear list of what have you done, right? Did you make clear what the expectations were? Did you tell, give them feedback? I don't think it's fair to decide to fire someone if you haven't been really direct with them about the impact their behavior is having. And that's one of the things that people who do get fired often say of like, I just didn't even know. Like, I didn't know this was a problem. I didn't know the the consequences that that were resulting from me doing these things. Mm -hmm. And so the I, you have to really hone your skills around direct and honest feedback before you can even make that that 
decision. You know, and and ultimately it's it has to be your call. Are there things that they bring that are valuable, right? Are you everything's a trade-off? Are the benefits of having them part of the team outweighing some of the real hassle? Or has it gotten to the point where it's just much more hassle than it is benefit? Is that helpful? That is. And I think it's so hard when managing a team to understand if it's my behavior that needs to change or if it is their behavior that maybe I don't have control over changing. Yes. Because I'm always trying to think, okay, this is my fault. If I just did this a different way or if I just said this in a different way, maybe they would feel more comfortable being open with me. Or I think that's where I'm struggling the most is trying to understand whether it's my behavior. And it's such a good question to ask because I think a lot of times we don't reflect on that of like, have I done everything? And that's where I think the empathy can really come in of like, if I was in this person's shoes, what would I want from a manager, right? If I were underperforming in a certain way, or if I was, you know, um, you know, over my head on a certain task, what would I want my manager to do? And now that's not going to be the exact right answer because it's what you would want, but then also what would be most beneficial to them. The best thing you can do with a new employee is just lay the groundwork for open and honest conversation and even say things like, neither of us knows if this is going to work out. So let's just keep talking about what's working and what's not. I want to hear your feedback about me as a boss. I'm going to give you direct feedback. You won't always be comfortable, but we're going to do it because that's what makes this working relationship strong. And then I think you have to continually assess, like, have I done everything I could? And you're also not perfect, right? Mm -hmm. So you're not going to necessarily be able to do exactly what they need. And sometimes there is a misalignment between what an employee needs and what that manager can provide. And that also is a reason sometimes to part ways. One of the best things I did, maybe starting two years ago when I really started the business was... I do trials for everyone before they officially start. So Mm -hmm. if they don't have a current job, then the trial could last a week to 30 days. And if they do, then they'll come in on Saturday or Sunday, like the weekend. So it doesn't seem suspicious at their current job. Mm -hmm. But I always say, you know, it's a two-way street. I think a lot of managers think I am making the decision on you, whether you will be an employee at the company. But just as much they should decide whether I am the type of manager they want to be with. So Mm -hmm. having even that weekend to work together and just see my working style, see their working style and make sure there's a fit is really, really important. And I feel like most people don't do that. And it's hard to assess whether you're going to enjoy the manager from a two hour interview. Yeah, absolutely. And have you found with the trial, sometimes you decide not to proceed? Yeah. Uh, Yeah. I think two times we've decided not to proceed. And it's usually mutual. It's just that my working style doesn't fit with theirs or theirs wasn't right at quite at the level I needed it to be. Yeah. But then for the ones that it does work out, it's really good because they go in not blind to the position. They have a really good sense of the working style and the culture and who we are and what we're about. There's so many times I've been in a job where I was like, if I had just had a week here, I would have, I would have known. Yeah. And sometimes it's like, how great it is. And sometimes it's how awful it is. Right. <laughs> and so, and I, I think about this with buying houses too, right. Is the idea that you go to an open house and then make probably the largest financial decision of your life based on that tour is absurd. Right? Yeah, it and is. It, I think that's true of job interviews too, right? Like sometimes it's an hour long and now I'm just deciding I'm going to spend every day with you people for the next 10 years. Like what? And I, so I love that you're doing these trials. I wish, my, I assume you pay people of for course, the, yes, yes. <laughs> the, the worst, there was this trend for a while where employers were giving people, you know, s- s- assigning them a project as the interview and not paying them, which I just no, think is no. terrible. No, yeah. I hate that. Yeah. No, we basically, we, if they're going to get a trial, we've already discussed compensation. We've already agreed on compensation. Yeah. So it's just a prorated version of their compensation. That's and right. the idea is after the trial, if it's successful, if I loved it, if they loved it, then the full-time offer is made. Right. And when you, at the end of the trial, I'm fascinated by this. At the end of the trial, do you ask, you know, do you ask them first? Like, how are you feeling? Yeah. Do you? Okay. Yeah. Always. Always. So I ask them and then 
always at the end of the trial, I've made the decision already. So after I ask them if they're happy, mm -hmm. then I go ahead and say, you know, I also felt the same way. I'm really excited of us working together and I'd like to officially present you with an offer. Yeah. And there have been, you know, you bond so much with these people through even the trials that there have been tears when I offer the job because I'm just, I'm really grateful for people, the fact that people are quitting their jobs to come work for me and putting that trust in me and the vision and what I'm building. Right. That's a big thing. You're spending more working hours with me than you're spending not working, right? Yes. yes. God, so. and if, if more employees realized that, that the, you know, and I think it, it's, of course, for you, your business is you, right? So they're really, when they're choosing to quit their job and come work with you, they're believing in you. Mm -hmm. But even if you're, you know, a middle manager in a huge corporation, recognizing that this commitment, this decision to, like you said, spend day in and day out with these people, um, to be committed to whatever the mission of the organization is, is a huge decision. And and we don't, A, we shouldn't expect people to make it lightly, and we should honor that, right? We should honor the fact that that this is, they, they likely could work elsewhere, and they've made this decision, so we should respect it. One of the things I try to tell myself when I'm dealing with someone who I find really challenging is pushing all of my buttons. Maybe they're super passive aggressive or, um, you know, know it all or whatever. I just remind myself, this is give this is good information about what I don't want to do, mm. right? And I think that's if you take nothing away from a, a challenging relationship with a coworker or a difficult boss at least you can take away i've learned what doesn't work and and then you can carry that out and create the kind of team culture the kind of relationships that you want to have at work and you know there's one other thing i do want to say about relationships at work because we've been talking about these challenging people difficult people when you look at most of the research or surveys done around people and their coworkers most people like the majority of their coworkers. Almost everyone has someone who they find difficult. It's like usually like between 90 and 98% of people say they work with someone difficult, but most people say they love working with most of the people they work with. And yet those difficult people take up a huge amount of our brain space. So one of the critical things to do is to remember to lean into the positive relationships. Remember, okay, this person is so annoying. <laughs> they are making me question myself. They're um, undermining me. Yes, that's all terrible. And yet I have these other, I have my besties, mm -hmm. right? I have, I have the people who I love working with. And that's the majority of the people. Because I think that we can trick ourselves into thinking things are terrible when it's just one, two, sometimes three people dragging us down. So I've heard you talk about this before. There's a term for it. Is it negativity bias or something? Yes, exactly. So that we are negative because we're um, constantly as humans scanning for threat. When something feels threatening to us, we focus on it, right? Because mm -hmm. we want to protect ourselves from it. We want to, you know, do whatever we can to counter that negativity or that threat. So we'll be focused. Our bias is toward focusing on those negative relationships instead of the, the more positive ones. So how are you personally working on that? How can we fix that? Yeah. So, OK, one thing I do very practically, I have a compliments folder in my email. I actually have two different email accounts, so I have two different ones. Anytime I get a compliment, I put it in there because I won't remember it. And and any, you know, starky, rude email, delete. Like, get rid of them. Don't let them linger. So that's just a very small practical tip. Um, the other thing is, if you find someone in particular is taking up a lot of your mental space, like you're waking up at 3 a.m. thinking about them, you're thinking about them while you're making dinner, right? You're, you're just haven't thought about other team members because you're so focused on them. Allow yourself to do that, but set a timer. Like mm. set your phone timer for 15 minutes and just say, I'm going to think about them right now. And I'm going to think about how horrible it is. I maybe do a little problem solving. Yes. But then when that's over, I'm done. I'm not allowed to think about them again. And it's just sort of like a meditation exercise. You want to just try to sort of refocus your attention on the positive things. What's happening? Good. What's And even, I know this has become like cliche at this point, but things like gratitude exercises, um, you know, if you if the thing that's really bothering you is a work relationship, can you create a list of all the positive relationships you have or all the things you like about your job? 
right? What did what are the positives about my team? Yes, there are these issues and we're working on those, but chances are you have a much longer list of, of the positive. So the podcast is called Erica Taught Me, but really today is all about Amy Taught Me. So what do you want people to walk away saying, Amy taught me this? The thing that matters most to me when I think about the work I do is that I want people to have fewer sleepless nights, right? I don't, and when I think about what do I want people to take away, I want them to take away that, yes, these things are hard. Yes, difficult interactions are messy. The dynamics at work can be really trying, but you do have the agency to do something about it. And there are tools available to actually take concrete action. And will they work 100% of the time? Absolutely not. But you have it in your power to do something about the situation. You're not subjected to it. You can actually influence it. I really love that. Thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you. This has been really fun. Yay. (laughs) If you've enjoyed the episode, please take a moment to leave a review. It really helps support what we're doing. Thanks for listening. And I'll talk to you next Tuesday on a brand new episode of Erica Taught Me.